There's a couple of things that I've learned this week. The first one is that people seem to really like the new Battlefield 5 map. And secondly, you guys seem to really like my more relaxed style of content. I made that lunge mine video a couple of days back and it was kind of very different from my normal content. And on both of those points, that's really good for me because if people are happy with Battlefield 5 for once, then that's just great news in general. And I may not have to do as many scripted commentaries anymore because you liked the lunge mine video. So for me, that's a big thumbs up. In this video today, though, we're going full jungle sniper mode. This gun is now in its natural habitat for the first time since it was released with Chapter 5. And the gameplay that you're watching was captured on the first day when the new map launched. So if you see some players kind of standing out in the open or not using cover properly, it's probably because they didn't really know what they were doing when they first joined the new map. I did end up sniping a lot of their heads, though, so that does make for for good background footage, and that's what's really important here, that the video looks good. <laughs> but Solomon Islands, though, I wanted to use this video to give you my thoughts on the new map and all of the new content that's come with update 6.0, because I've spent about eight hours a day for the last three days playing this update, and so far, in general, I'm really, really enjoying it. And we're going to start with the weapons. I really like them. The M2 Carbine is one of those rare weapons that DICE adds to the game that really clicks with me the moment it's launched. And so far, I am absolutely loving this thing. We've got a super fast rate of fire. There's a high bullet count per magazine. There's a little bit of recoil there, even though at this weapon balance state, with most of the recoil turned down, there is still a bit of recoil that you need to be aware of. It is fairly easy to control, but I really like the M2. So much so that I've already completed the min and gold assignments for this weapon, and I think that's the fastest that I've ever completed those after a weapon's release. Usually it takes me a few weeks. I'll get round to it once I'm covering other stuff in my videos, but because I've been playing this new map so much, I've already fully minted and golded the M2 carbine. But I am not going to fully review this weapon at the moment because there's simply no point because DICE is going to be changing the weapon balance all over again in update 6.2. So for all of the weapons, that's the Type 11, the new shotgun and the M2 here, I'm going to wait until update 6.2 to do those videos. But considering Battlefield 5's weapon balance right now is basically worked around rate of fire, i.e. the higher the rate of fire, the better that gun is going to be, you might as well use the M2 Carbine. You can pump out 830 rounds per minute with this thing, so it's probably going to benefit you in most situations at close to medium range. Then there's the Lunge Mine, which is, in my opinion, the greatest gadget that DICE has released so far for Battlefield 5. The thing is really fun to use. It's also infuriating to use because most of the time when you go to use it, someone notices that you're charging across the battlefield with a plunger in your hand going towards a tank and somebody shoots you. But when you do manage to pull off like a tank takedown with this thing, it feels really, really satisfying. I've only done about three, I think maybe four of them so far. Most of my kills with the thing, I've just been going around booping people in the back with it and then flying backwards as that person goes back to the spawn screen. But yeah, this thing is just a bit of a laugh, really. I don't think it's a very serious gadget, although if you do use it properly, it can be very, very effective. And if you go round in a squad with someone else that's using one, and if you coordinate against tanks, especially the light tanks here on Solomon Islands, you're doing 50 damage with the lunge mine. So two in quick succession and you're going to take down a tank really, really quickly. Usually, you don't want to get too close to tanks because they're so powerful, and they will just send you back to the spawn screen. But now with the lunge mine, you kind of want to circle tanks like a shark, maybe hit them with a couple of bazooka rounds, or wait for some other rounds to come in because everyone loves firing explosives at tanks, and then you just kind of wait for the right time to charge in with the lunge mine, and then you take the thing out. I think it's going to really change how infantry behave around tanks and it's definitely going to have an effect on how tank drivers position themselves on different maps because now the infantry have to come in to such close range in order to do that amount of damage to a tank, I think tankers are going to be looking around a lot more rather than just staring in one direction. So it's kind of a buff for infantry, but it's just kind of going to completely change the meta 
around tank gameplay, I think. There's also the Type 11 light machine gun. That's a little bit special in my eyes, and it actually reminds me of one of the light machine guns that DICE added to the Russian DLC back in Battlefield 1. That one was called the Perino. This here with the Type 11, it kind of operates in a similar way. It's got this side hopper that you can fill up with different layers of bullets. And in Battlefield 1 with the Perino, it was like that you were stacking slices of bread on top of each other or something. But the Type 11 kind of does the same thing. But you have to unlock the ability to fill the hopper rather than it just being the standard way to reload it. When you first start using the Type 11, you're going to notice that your soldier just reloads the standard way by uncoupling the hopper off the side of it and then putting a new full one on in its place. Once you start to rank the weapon up, that's when you can apply the specialization that will allow you to refill the hopper with stripper clips of ammunition. And in some cases, that will actually take you less time to reload than removing the hopper and doing it all in that way. And I think that's a really cool system, and it makes the weapon unique as well. Sometimes it's not about the statistics and how quickly a gun can kill people, but sometimes if it looks cool and it sounds cool, or it's got a strange reload animation like the Type 11 here, that's often a good enough reason for me to go and use it for a little bit, to kind of just change things up and experience something different. And then there's also the new bazooka launcher as well. Finally, the Americans get their iconic launcher added to Battlefield 5. And it comes in as the launcher that's pretty much going to replace everything else for me, quite frankly. Comparing it to its direct opposite, which is the Panzerfaust, it is just a straight upgrade across the board. It doesn't take as long to reload. You can aim down sight with it, and it's got nice clear iron sights on it. It's got the lowest amount of projectile drop of any of the launchers in the game. That means you don't have to aim as high above the target at longer range. And to top it all off, it does more damage to tanks. So I'm not sure if DICE intended the bazooka to be such a good gadget or not, at least when you compare it to other gadgets already in the game. Maybe in update 6.2 we're going to see buffs for the Panzerfaust and the Piat, but don't really know right now. But what is clear right now is this is the choice that you should be going for if you want to use your launcher as an assault player. And there's actually one other thing as well. The maximum amount of ammunition you can carry with the bazooka is five rounds. You get one in the bazooka and then four in reserve. That's more than any other launcher in the game. So you can wander around and you can basically take the ammo levels from the Battlefield 4 and Battlefield 3 days but you're in Battlefield 5, you've got way more ammunition than some of the other soldiers out there. I just remember back in the Battlefield 4 days where engineers would just be pulling rockets out of some kind of quiver on their back and they'd just be hammering tanks all day long with all those explosives. The bazooka kind of feels like another gadget that DICE is trying to inject some chaotic mayhem back into Battlefield 5. And using it to snipe infantry across the map or annoy a tank, that would normally be out of reach. That's now really effective, and you can do those kind of things in Battlefield 5 again. I'm not suggesting you do it all the time. Obviously, you should be playing the objective and doing all those kinds of things. But if you spot a sniper that's kind of annoying you, you could fire a bazooka. And because it's not got as much drop, it might be much easier to hit that sniper than if you were to use the Panzerfaust, for example. So again, it's another thing that I'm really enjoying with Battlefield 5 at the moment. Now, as well as the new weapons and gadgets, of course, there is a new map here, Solomon Islands, sort of the central piece of content, really. And very much like the weapons and gadgets, I really like the new map. It does have a little bit less jungle than I'd really like, but then again, DICE didn't reveal the map until very close to its launch, which didn't leave us much time to think beyond Oh, it's a jungle map. Everyone thought it would just be jungle. That's really not the case. And the trailer did show off all the locations, so we sort of had the idea that it would be half jungle and half island coastal areas. But just my personal preference, I would have liked a bit more jungle area to fight in. There is actually a section of the map that could have been extended into. Clearly, it hasn't been modelled in any way, shape or form to allow for proper gameplay, but there is another section of jungle on an island around the side here that could have made for a good bit of gameplay, but that hasn't been the case. 
But the flow of the map is really nice on Conquest though, the rivers with the dinghy boats, those make for some great fast flanking routes, you can kind of get away from the action, you can go to the back of the map, cap a flag over there and all the action then sort of starts to shift all over the place, which is pretty nice. But I think the way the map flows on Breakthrough, now that I've played it several times as a defender and as an attacker, that could do with a bit of an improvement because if the attacking team are strong and aggressive, they can push through areas really, really quickly, especially sectors where there's only one flag. And unfortunately, Solomon Islands has fallen victim to the same problems we had on Wake Island, where the attackers get so many tanks that the defenders are completely overwhelmed in the first sector. And if you're not careful, it can just turn into a complete steamroll. It's the last sector though where most of the problems lie. The Japanese have to defend their radio tower base and again this is one of those sectors where there's only one flag. It's probably the worst sector at the moment because even though the voiceover tells you as a defender that you need to fortify this sector, there's barely any fortifications you can actually build to defend what is your final base. That's the last stand before you either win or lose. And I thought that the end of Breakthrough was supposed to be a big battle where the attackers are pushing really hard, the defenders are pushing really hard to try and hold on to things, and most of the time that doesn't really happen here on Solomon Islands because if you are defending, you're going to lose because it's too easy for the attacking Americans to push over the river and just onto the outskirts of the point around that flag, and they just take it without really pushing in. If the front of the base was scattered with a bunch of fortifications like log piles that would stop tanks and barbed wire to stop the infantry, it would slow everything down and it would stop them being able to capture the point without really having to do anything. All they have to do at the moment is cross the river and they basically win and I don't think that's how breakthrough should work, especially on the final sector. It should be much harder for the attackers to take that sector because they've worked through a bunch of easier sectors first. So at the moment, it's kind of like an anticlimactic ending to Breakthrough on Solomon Islands because you know as the defenders, you're pretty much gonna get rolled over in a matter of minutes. But despite all this though, I don't think there's another map in the game right now that really offers the kind of action that Solomon Islands does. It's this mix of infantry, fast light vehicles, and then light tanks sprinkled on the top. All the smaller European maps, they come with medium and heavy tanks and then some of them have planes in the sky as well. The other Pacific maps, they have planes in the sky too. Solomon Islands, I think, is actually the only map in the game where you only have infantry and light armoured vehicles fighting together and fighting against each other. And I think it works really well. So there you go, after 24 hours of game time over the last three days, I'm still really enjoying Solomon Islands and I've nearly got rid of my cold. Thanks very much for watching today, guys. I've got some more cool videos lined up for the next week or so. I'm actually going to do a video on another World War II game. This one's called Days of War. You might remember that I made a few videos about it a couple of years ago. It's finally come out of early access and it has been released, so I'm going to do a video on that. But yeah, thanks for watching this video, and I'll catch you all in the next one.